So welcome everyone. It's a pleasure for me to introduce you today, Professor Tobias Larsen from um, Blekinge Institute of Technology in Sweden. So let's introduce him with a short uh, bibliography. Starting out as a PhD with research in the area of simulation-driven design within a product development context, Tobias Larsen is continuously focusing on the digitalization and transformation going on in industry. We start in computer-aided engineering processes and more recently on a model-based digitalization work where digital twin and IoT comes together for delivering customer value through product system, from product service systems, sorry, in a circular economy. Most of efforts are directed to simulation-driven decision support in the conceptual design phase and of the development of innovative product service systems supporting organizations in the development of innovation capability to deliver the innovative and sustainable solutions of tomorrow. He has extensive experience from applied research and projects in the intersection between academia and industry and has initiated, led and concluded several national and international research projects. Primarily researching digitalized product development and innovation engineering within the aerospace, automotive and industrial sector and now healthcare sector application in, um, is on the rise. So I will let the stage to Professor Tobias Larsen. I think you are going to hear him, you are going to see his slide, but sometimes he disappeared. The, vi the video is not so robust today, but don't worry, he will still be with us. So Tobias, your turn. Thank you. Uh, yes, the video is probably on and off, but uh, we'll hope that uh, we manage the audio at least. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me here for this uh, keynote at the Design 2020 conference. Um, today we're going to explore a little bit on the artificial intelligence, uh, whether that might be the end for the designer as we know it or not. So. Um, is AI a friend or a foe for the design tasks? We're gonna explore that a little bit. So first, just to give you a little bit on the background uh, from the environment I'm coming from, we are an applied research unit with digital at the core. We are some 30 people doing applied research within product development, and we also teach uh, the different engineering programs around this be mechanical engineering, industrial economy, etc. While being digital at the core, uh, we have three main streams of interest in our research and education. It's very so to a solution with tomorrow's coming one. We look at product service where we have the idea of the life cycle active, and we also look at the dream development. The idea that all aspects of the product service systems or any kind of solution should be able to relate. We are applied at the core and work very closely with industry partners in their R&D to support them in the development of the next uh, generation of engineers desktop. So moving into the kind of topic of today, uh, anybody remember this? Probably, for most of you, this might be the first AI most people are aware of. This is HAL from 2001 A Space Odyssey, 1968, based on the Arthur Clarke Space Odyssey novels. HAL, or the Heuristically Programmed Algorithmic Computer, was the sentient computer or artificial general intelligence that controlled the system of the Discovery One spacecraft and interacted with the ship's astronaut crew. I assume the younger ones might not know, but as middle-aged, this is probably the first time we got in contact with AI based on HAL. 
And this is where we start our journey on AI process. So HAL was intended to support and ship. HAL was to do so. In the movie, it comes from that viewpoint. The, the astronaut basically retreat to a pod to discuss HAL's apparent malfunctions and whether they should disconnect him or not. Astronauts Dave imagines Hal's view and says, well, I don't know what he'd think about it. And this is kind of interesting. Back in 68, will it be ethical and not merely disturbing to disconnect or basically kill a conversational elder care robot from the bedside of a lonely senior citizen in the future society? So we will keep AI in mind, have it there in the back of our head while we explore our way through these area together with industrial developments. AI movies, I think most of them are of the kind of dystopian future. Uh, the outlook that in this term in the world, we typically have two opposites painted, the dystopian AI controlled future and the happy future. It is just that people seem more knowledgeable about the dystopian one, since we do not really know what the utopian one might be, other than typically green and shiny blue. This was a little bit on the topic where Alibaba's Jack Ma and Tesla's Elon Musk took the opposing views of the risk and potential rewards of AI at an event in Singapore, or, or sorry, in Shanghai the other year. The Chinese entrepreneur basically said he was quite optimistic about AI and thought it was nothing for street smart people like them to be scared of. And it's like the words that test added technology past the ability to understand it. It's interesting, probably at this point, talking about a kind of span. AI or narrow AI, and Elon talking a little bit more on the general AI, the more human-like AI. And if we take a deeper look at their respective businesses, we might be more enlightened. So if we continue down the path of Tesla and Alibaba, we start to see the reality. These are robots in production and in logistics, programmed for the task. But where we're going is towards smart, smart factories or industries and connect the production system, what is coined Industry 4.0. One major difference, however, between these differences between their, their businesses is that while Alibaba sort goods and Elon now, the products of Elon might be why he might be more concerned. A Tesla rogue that they might not on the Alibaba robot. Although the auto autonomous car is still safer than probably most of the random drivers, may they be drunk, tired, or any kind of li liability, we actually have a hard time accepting any, any failure or uh, we can't accept any failure of the human driver. If we look away from the products and look at the driving technologies today, where do we end up? It's basically at the fourth industrial revolution. It's typically referred to as Industry 4.0. It is believed to have a profound impact on various industrial sectors, especially the manufacturing domains. Industry 4.0 focuses on end-to-end -end digitization of all the physical assets and its integration into the digital ecosystem. characterized by emerging technologies such as Internet of Things, additive manufacturing, mobile net, networks, data, cyber physics, and artificial intelligence. And also the kind of disconnection between geographical locations as this is digitally driven. Is this now emerging technologies? No, not really. It already exists. 
of AI as the bad guy and not being dystopian about cobots or humanoids? Well, probably that is because uh, it is the AI that's going to control your car or your bot. And that is a huge unknown. So let us look at some of the tech fields and what's been going on. If we look at the mechanical engineering view, we have the typical stereotype of the classic mechanical engineer or engineering designer. And that view is probably the drawing board and the drafters, which we see to the left here. Then up to the right, we see Sutherland working in Sketchpad in 1963, something he developed as part of his MIT thesis, being the first kind of digital sketching system. The rest is basically history. 2D go to 3D, and the usage of the models based on circulation. Image to write with stress fire method, which is basically today a standard to run on any kind of CAD model. After that, we added assemblies, automated drawings, production support, etc., and basically expanded the view of what you can do with these digital assets and CA systems. And today, in most product developing companies, the geometry, geometry definition, which is at the core of any kind of hardware manufacturer, while also at the same time adding sustainability calculations, cost, value, etc. If we move into production system, it has also seen its fair share of development from pure manual assembly to assembly line assisted, basically the Henry Ford assembly line, and a higher and higher level of automation. While making the previous unsafe environment safer and more productive, it has also seen people shift away from being close to the production line and close to the products to more or more be outside the factory channels. This has also caused job shift from being a welder close to the product to base the robot will see from building the that now building. We know that though in manufacturing is assumed to take the next leap. It is also the introduction of new manufacturing that's also been a fair share of radical shifts. The latest one, if we focus on that one, is being going from subtractive manufacturing, milling, turning, etc., where you take away material, towards additive manufacturing, referred commonly as 3D printing, where the last decade has seen some many potential fields, house construction, design item, as well as regular products. Flexibility built in via digital models and low reconfiguration costs are obvious. Also, the impact of the tech onto the design process and development of products. To the left, we basically have a robot built tribute to the 60s modernist Panton chair, the first molded plastic chair back in 1967, today 3D printed, a point to future faster 3D printing. Right top, we have APIS Core, a San Francisco based startup printing houses in concrete within a day or 24 hours. Right bottom, we have the MX3D printing full scale stainless steel bridges in Amsterdam together with their partners. And nothing of this is completely ready today, but we're getting there as tech matures, prices of their production methodologies and their products basically go down. Moving into the design of these objects, comes more interest with regard to likes. The previous manual process of design, calculation, production, etc., now becomes highly computer supported. Top and lower left is the Airbus example of an internal wall in an aircraft. This is coming from a 2016 example where this bionic partition was presented for Airbus and developed by the De Living, which was at the time an Autodesk experimentation study in New York that basically applies generative data from biological world onto the generative design. 
perforated but more resistant than current ones thanks to the design it allows a 55 percent reduction in the weight of the internal walls which means much greener aircrafts because of less fuel consumption within these given boundaries these ai algorithms find the optimum in this case a strength weight ratio We're for another outer disk pro of generative design, design automation. It is drone structure. So we saw how the shape optimizes it, the awesome shape and toss in part of the drone. Adding sensors to such a structure, a product or prototype, paves the way also to Internet of Things and big data exploration by getting data from prototypes out on the market. So let us loop into that and the AI branch of machine learning. So I stay with the aerospace industry. And here comes an example, which is basically coming from our own research where we can have computers and sensors because they come cheaper and more powerful. We are capable of collecting huge amounts of data in quick and convenient way, like for example, purchases in a store, credit card transactions, searches in Google, Facebook, etc., And also, in fact, the elite going on. The wheels, no unexpected need. If we and what they we can competitive and therefore generate more potential value. This this it's a jet engine design where the goal is to find a kind of maximum value and sustainability profile. As seen on the geometries in the bottom, there are lots of what we call illities. It can be sustainability, availability, manufacturability, etc. Those are the aspects what we want to try to scan for a solution over its lifetime. The digital queens concept also comes into play where a digital version of the physical one is used for both predictive modeling and analysis, but also to attach live data to. Previously using simulation only, we now use data feeds to build a new experience of the performance in value sustainability. And for that case, also other interesting aspects, while allowing, in this case, machine learning to sweep design solutions. Machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence. As defined by computer scientist Tom Mitchell, machine learning is the study of computer apps improve through experience. And in this case, machine learning is supportive the design and find the right for it where you optimize the sustainability values while also keeping value high. These fields are driven and AI are driven by the computational power. All the progress is coming from the integrated circuit development represented here in the Moore's law representation where Moore's law being the number of transistors doubles every second years, making computational power increase at an ever decreasing cost. And this is one of the core enablers for Industry 4.0, AI and Internet of Things. And if Internet of Things is being enabled, as we see in this curve, another exponential curve, connectedness is happening. And when connectedness is happening, this means more devices be connected, more data can stream in, and more smart solutions can be developed. This allows us to see smarter, smarter solutions, and also allowing them to be connected into systems of systems. In the example, we move away from the classic of a tractor to an entire farming ecosystem and get to smart farming where earth humidity tells where the watering is needed, when fruit is ready, et cetera, et cetera, using all the data you can get from and have AI 
innovation at the core of the farm management system. These are not example. The potential product services we as engineers can develop these days. It's not symbols and more of digital streams. And talking about these nuts and bolts, the classic mechanical engineer used to design items to the left, the nuts and bolts, and now we shall design entire ecosystems, product service systems, or systems of systems that are usually function oriented or purpose driven. They are multidisciplinary and complex. And intentionally service systems or ecosystems means that you move away from well-defined requirements and a well-set design space into ill-defined or wicked problems and a huge design space to explore. Also, the new technologies disrupt the existing development processes we have. Here are some perspectives of development processes. And what we see at the core is that CAE has come in and is growing from that and adding support to different parts of this process. And with the kind of computational power we have and with the decision power coming in from AI, the different branches of AI, we will see that all these processes are also going to change in the future. Another example from our own research is the ongoing digitalization, electrification, and automation coming into a company in the business of moving dirt. New technologies disrupt the existing product development process and take new shape regarding both the business, how you consume the product, and how you see service, and how you see technology. New concepts are evaluated early on on their entire performance not only the technology such is sustainable it's about value performance a lot of aspects and this is being prototyped tested live with customers before hitting the market in this case the prototypes uh, rounded up some 98 percent co2 reduction with new machines running them at the site as previous machines in the lower left corner, we see the first commercial deployment of zero emission machines coming out based on such a process. But reflecting back on the presented items on research, there are now plenty of papers coming out at an accelerated pace on AI, machine, big data, and the impact on design. Is this new? Well, not really, as we see in these papers. We have here to the left a paper from 1992 discussing artificial intelligence or whether it empowers human designers or replace human designers. So it's not really a new field. So what has changed? Well, yeah, recently new, but the quotation is new. Mature not here in nine as it is today. So old reasoning and research might still be valid, but in a new. And moving into the job discussion, AI for sure will have the potential to kill mundane, low skilled job with the highest potential of automation. As we see here to the left, a library technician, automation risk 99%, that might for sure go away. But also top pay jobs uh, has high automation risk. We see a uh, number two here, nuclear power reactor operator, 95% automation risk. But as we showed earlier, this has always been the thing with new technology. You used to stand there welding a car. Now it's a robot welding that car. So potentially this is good. But as an engineer, well, we take this some data, we see that mechanical engineer uh, have one port to be placed by a robot that does make you but in general as we will conclude a little bit it's also understand on how you evolve with the job description 
the mechanical engineers we are educating today is not the same mechanical engineers that were educated uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So, is it an opportunity or threat with AI? Is it a fight or flight situation? Well, if we have different kinds of AI, the general AI, which is more on basically mirror human intelligence by providing opportunities for autonomous learning and problem solving, this can of course be seen as a potential uh, killer of human jobs. But this kind of general AI, this is what we see in Jarvis of Iron Man and what we see in Skynet Terminator. It's not really here. Uh, we are very far from reaching main capacity. Some computers are being bored, etc. There are some kind of technology here. But AI is not here. It's a future thing. Narrow AI, however which is a specific type of artificial intelligence in which a technology outperforms humans in some very narrowly defined task. This is what we see, and this is the example of machine learning in aerospace. This can offload in very specific areas. You have self-driving cars, service bots, etc. It can very easily leverage data-driven fields. For example, mining huge amounts of medicine health data to make cheaper drug development, where typically there can be uh, 2.5 billion USD uh, US dollars in developing drugs. This will take away jobs, but ultimately also create new jobs because there's all who should train that AI and watch over the AI. So this is something where we have a certain maturity and companies are investing in this also. It's an efficiency thing. And to actually, from that 1992 article, as long as general AI is not here uh, for the framing of ill-defined problems, we see the core issues and the integration problems I'm solving. Uh, it's highly likely that the engineer of today will also be the engineer of tomorrow on dealing with those issues. So to sum this up, as the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, the only cause So probably we will have the narrow AI shift jobs around in a design office. Pretty much like the production floor has seen people move further and further away from product, products being built. There's also an opportunity here to get rid of those mundane tasks that can be automated and leverage the new amount of huge data coming in from Internet of Things. There will also be new job descriptions with the design work, a new development process as we move towards the sports society. Of course, following hearing education. So here's an example coming from all that Camp of TV in 2000. Look at the dates that are to train for the engineer of the future. And as you see here, this is difference in fields. It's not talking mechanics, it's talking other traits. So by training different traits, we can stay forward compliant basically. But at the same time, looking at what has been done so far, we see the designer Lorenzo Luti of Cartel designing that chair, 3D printing. They used half a kilo of material in a share of five kilos, that's a substantial difference. And this is all through that massive computational power and the algorithms. And Dassault is backing that up. It's excellent to improve on existing concepts. Design not the they will have to know. Or else Hal will back. So by that, thank you. And can move to questions. Thank you for listening in. Thank you very much, Tobias, for this very interesting uh, speech and talk. Um, unfortunately, the sound was not very, very good. So I hope you all can hear us for the Q&A now. Uh, 
Um, first, I will uh, thank you, uh, John Gero, for his um, clever uh, remark, saying that the three letters HAL, H-A-L, were the three letters preceding IBM at a time when IBM was the first computing company in the world. So it's, That's a good reflection. Yes, it's funny to see that. Thank you very much, John. Um, I, I, I work myself, myself on uh, artificial intelligence in, in different domain. And um, I, I was very um, interested by, by your, your talk, uh, Tobias. And um, for me, what reassured me very often is to tell me that Robots uh, are for tasks with no value, no added value. And so maybe we can work together, uh, keeping the expertise and um, the know-how, the specific know-how from your man being and your, your man competencies and uh, trying to uh, take robots for um, repetitive tasks and no added value tasks. I agree totally. I think uh, the robot does not need to sleep. Uh, it doesn't ask questions. So if we're looking at that kind of uh, automation, I'm completely in agreement that uh, taking away dangerous operations and mundane uh, iterative operations, I think that's also the kind of automation that's been done so far, and I think that will continue. OK, thank you. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Sumbul Khan saying, um, thank you for the presentation. What is the potential of, arti of artificial intelligent, uh, intelligence in education and especially in design education? I think there's a huge potential there also. Uh, it's coming down to whether you are um, teaching lots of material that a student should yet basically compile and uh, have in their mind. This can be taught in, in completely different ways than we're doing today, or whether there is a value in, a, let's say, uh, a rich communication and interaction. Uh, and I think uh, where you have the need for rich interaction, I still would see the human teacher being present, but I also see a lot of areas where uh, there could be an interaction with a bot, basically, uh, to progress in your learning. So there's a huge potential here with, uh, for example, the ongoing pandemic for all. Think. Okay. Uh, we have another question from George Fadel. Uh, thank you for the interesting keynote. A question about artificial intelligence. We typically train the AA machine to do what we do and do it better, make decisions faster. But for instance, AlphaZero, Google's AI machine learned by itself. So do you think machines will outlearn us and outdesign us? Well, I mean, if you now look at the general AI, which I think they are working on, not uh, uh, the more uh, confined AI, uh, for sure. The big question is, is going to be well, when that happens, which I still think is very far away. Uh, those AIs will, of course, ask themselves uh, what humans can do for them. But I think the, the obvious answer here is, of course, that we design machines to do things we want but when you have a superior knowledge uh, can we come up with tasks for that machine and will that machine come up with their own tasks uh, and i think that's what they are exploring okay thank you tobias uh tim thank you very much for your speech um he outlined that you try to see a, a lot of different aspects on ai but he would like you to comment, to comment on some of the up and down sides of AI in the context on, of environmentally sustainable design. Yeah, I, I actually see what Tim is writing here. So uh, 
uh, yes, I did not touch so much much upon that. I think the the obvious um, uh, sustainability traits are, of course, around using less material. Um, and when you're using less material, it's of course uh, good because you don't dig up a lot of things. At the same time, uh, with uh, individualization and much faster potential, for example, for 3D printing, we could see a bad thing that we uh, really produce a lot of plastic items which are being used at a low cost once or twice and then being put as a potential negative effect on the environment. So I think there are with all new technologies and, and all new potentials, there are both ups and downs. Uh, and uh, I think we are exploring a lot on how we can use generative engineering and AI for not digging up uh, new material, but reusing old material and, and keep it in the, the circle, the, the cyclic behavior. That's our interest here. Yeah, it's um, your answer is linked also to uh, Jeremy Faludi question, um, saying that uh, you had several examples on AI adding data sensors for more sustainable products, but adding electronics to products that did not have them before introducing introduces much higher environmental impacts in manufacturing. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the ongoing trend we see now that everything is being connected, right? Uh, you have a connected toothbrush and just because you can connect things and put electronics in it, that's probably not what you should do. So I'm coming back there to why we do a lot of research. It's going down to the development processes. I think um, Sophie Halstead, who is doing a lot of our research on sustainability, is managing this field. But what I would like to say is that you have to change the product development process uh, based on what you can do with new technologies. If you have new production technologies and potentially new uh, material flows, you have to look at that upfront so you uh, understand the implications on the entire life cycle of your design choices. So just because you can put electronics in the product, you should probably not do that unless you have a plan on how you take it away and how you uh, re remanufacture or uh, take care of the materials when you're done. These processes, however, development processes do not exist yet. Okay, uh, um, a more specific question concerning our uh, um, design society from Clément Fortin, saying one of the greatest challenges uh, of applying AI is the availability of large data sets. So should we approach this in the design society or are there good sources of reference that big data for design? I, I, that's very interesting because uh, what big data means, it's huge data sets. So you need insanely big data sets to train uh, algorithms in a good way. And, and these data sets usually don't exist. This is why I think in Sweden, there are a lot of initiatives uh, to make sure that you have open data sources so that you publicly put data out there that others can use in research, in product development, etc. So I would second that, that it would be very interesting to have an initiative on um, how we can kind of collect those data sets that exist, because it's really hard to find uh, big data sets to work with. Yeah, another very interesting question from John Jero. Humans are good at recognizing problems. Current AI is about solving problems. So do you think AI can be developed that can recognize issues it has not been previously exposed to? Um, my initial response would be yes. I don't have a good example, but uh, for sure, yes. I think um, coming back to, again, uh, if you have access, which uh, Fotan was asking, if you have access to data, then you can start finding patterns and you can find irregularities. So, of course, based on that, you can find problems that you didn't even know they were problems. Uh, so, yes, I think so. 
again coming down to i'm not an ai researcher i'm a, a mechanical engineering designer which want who is applying ai and machine learning so i'm coming from that uh, angle yes for me one of the big issue is to manage both i mean by both the performance and efficiency of ai and anticipation naturalness emotion and spontaneity of the human being and so how can we mix both so that both can be very complementary? I, I think now uh, with that kind of questions and also see Yvonne asking about social problems, that's when we are stretching it, I think. Um, I, I really think that uh, there is the difference between the, the kind of AI we have today, the narrow AI and the kind of promise uh, which has been talked about when we have the kind of replication of human mind and uh, going further away from that, then I think we can explore uh, multifaceted spaces in a completely different way than what we're doing today. Okay, uh, Ola, uh, thank you also for your speech and ask um, do you think the work of designers will be impacted by AA and in this case, in what direction? Uh, yes, I think. I think that uh, designers, we are going to look at, let's call the ill-defined problem statement. So I think we will do less of uh, manual or even assisted analysis of things, less of stress calculations, less of that and more of the more uh, creative parts, let's call it early phases development. This has been said for a long time, but it has also happened, I think. Uh, the solid mechanics engineers of the uh, 1990s are being completely taken over by computers, finite elements. There still exist specialists, but on the broad side, there are fewer of them today. And I think we will see that there's a shift for us to do more in the early part of the design process and less in that repetitive part and uh, iterative phase. Another very interesting question from Maya about equality question. How do we train AI to design for equality and inclusion? The best examples, example is medical industry and car industry where things are designed for a male body organism. I agree. That's, of course, a, a problem in, in how you put your uh, uh, framing of your problems. I think if you try to frame your problems in a kind of gender or norm critical point, I think uh, you can also solve them in another way. Uh, but, but I think there are that's that's actually one issue but i think also claudia here is is stating a larger question on the same topic uh, there are yeah. lots of ethical issues on, on what can be done here in in insanely fast tempo uh, and if we assume that ai is really fast and exploring a lot of design space really fast it might be hard for us as humans to kind of follow and understand the long-term implications of uh, the design choices. So this is why there is a huge debate on uh, the ethical side of AI, which is pretty much the same as the kind of ethical side of what you can do with CRISPR and uh, editing of your gene pool, so to say. So these are things which I think should not be taken lightly. Sp speaking still about education, Yuri asks you, do you think any risks that future engineers will know less and less about classical engineering? This won't pay off in the long term. Yes, uh, that's actually already the case. Um, and um, in certain fields, of course, uh, for, for certain people being educated, it might actually not be a big issue. But in other fields, it is a big issue. Uh, you don't want someone being responsible for bridge design if they don't really understand how that bridge has been designed and the implications of uh, errors, if you can't discover those errors. So I think there's a huge 
problem in education. And uh, this is being discussed also in, in one of the references I mentioned, that we try to put more and more on the engineer, but the engineer education is still the same length. So either you have to be more shallow or you take something away. So this is the constant ongoing debate. Should we do less of mathematics, less of physics, and more on uh, internet of things, etc.? There is always a cost. Yes. I, I personally think we have to be still open-minded and uh, careful about this, but uh, just like you, you, you work also on the healthcare sector, when we introduce telemedicine in healthcare, it doesn't mean we will erase traditional way of healthcare uh, systems. So we need both, but we need to balance between uh, traditional engineering and AI-based engineering. We need both telehealthcare and uh, traditional healthcare. So thank you very much, Tobias, for this moment uh, passed with all of us. And um, I invite you all for a short break. If you have still questions to ask to Tobias, feel free to ask uh, him in the Gather Me uh, after the last session. And so we have last session starting at uh, quarter past uh, three. Thank you, everyone, and see you soon. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining.